I have to say this, and I'll sit down. Back during slavery, when black people like me talked to the slaves, they didn't kill them. They sent some old house negro along behind them to undo what he said. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. And when the field Negro got too much out of line, he held him back in check. He put him back on the plantation. The house Negro could afford to do that because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. master. Good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. He was sick as the master. When the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was the house Negro. But then you had some field Negro who lived in a house, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes, they ate the worst food, and they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. But what they did, if the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> if the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. This was the difference between the two. And today you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. Slavery ends after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. In the next two years, blacks team up with Republicans and progressives in North Carolina and other southern states to form fusion politics, winning the right to vote for blacks during the federal reconstruction years of 1865 to 1877. Abraham Lincoln said that very intelligent blacks and the blacks that served in the Union Army should enjoy the right to vote in his last speech given on April 11, 1865. He was murdered in the same month. The new president, Andrew Johnson, pardoned all Southern whites restoring their political rights with which they used to create laws against black people. My purpose today is to inform you about the moral tradition and compare Dr. Williams and Josh Green. After reading other fiction books written in the 19th century, like Moby Dick, and Uncle Tom's Cabin, I can loudly say that the most important thing I took from it was how important it is to tell hard truths in fiction works. To build our country stronger for the future for our children, we need to teach and understand real history in America. After hearing my comparisons, you will better understand two key characters and decide what kind of person you are for yourself. First, you will hear about the Wilmington Massacre and the events leading to it. Next, you will hear about Dr. Williams and Josh Green. And finally, I'm going to give you a different way it could have went down. Now that our roadmap is in place, let's talk about Wil Wilmington, North Carolina. The history of Wilmington Massacre of 1898 begins in North Carolina 30 years after slavery ended. First, fusion politics, or blacks and whites voted together brought about black Republican elected representatives throughout the South. In every Southern state during these years, blacks were a majority of the Republican party and blacks made up 56% of the population of Wilmington. Second, by 1896, the fusionists elected a Republican governor who created reforms for blacks and working class whites. The black community built a foundation of black schools which led to inherited wealth and middle-class status. While three of 10 aldermen and 10 of the 26 policemen were black, Wilmington had one of the only, if not the only black owned daily newspapers in the country named the Daily Record. Two racist Europeans, Josephus Daniels, publisher of the most influential paper in North Carolina, and Fernifold Simmons, Democratic Party chairman decided they wanted to change politics and created a blatant operation they named the White Supremacy Campaign. The plan was to exploit the implicit bias of independence 
through propaganda and intimidation, while intimidating black voters with violence. One European-American newspaper put out an inflammatory speech from Rebecca Felton, a leading Georgia feminist, saying in part, if it requires lynching to protect women's dearest possession from ravening drunken human beasts, then I say lynch a hundred Negroes, a thousand Negroes a week, if it is necessary. The day before the 1898 elections, during a political rally, Alfred Reddell, a former congressman, said they are resolved to change the conditions of which we live if we have to choke the Cape Fear River with carcasses. Then he told the crowd of white people, find a Negro out voting, tell him to leave the polls. If he refuses, kill him, shoot him down in his tracks. In Wilmington, the vote was postponed until March of the following year. So the racist white man became restless and created a plan to spread through the newspapers reports of a race war planned by the black community. The Wilmington Messenger published the White Declaration of Independence on November 9th, which was a list of resolutions that said that all white men would no longer be ruled by men of African origin, and that blacks couldn't vote anymore, and that white men were to be given the jobs that black men currently held. On November 10th, 2,000 white men destroyed and burned down the daily record. White men then started killing blacks throughout the city and some black men who had guns fought back. The next day, blacks who were known Republicans were forced onto trains and threatened death if they returned. The black community was forced to hide in the black cemetery and the swamps for days. Thousands of blacks left Wilmington. Hundreds, it was said, were killed and thrown in a river nearby. Now that you know a little about the massacre, let's talk about the two characters who stuck out the most in the Morrow tradition. In Charles Waldell Chestnut's book, The Morrow Tradition, two characters continue to play in my head. First, we have Dr. Miller, who might be seen as an upper class black person with light brown skin, curly hair because he's a mixed race. A 30 year old man that is tall, sturdy, broad shouldered, clear eyed, good teeth, well dressed as the book describes him, his face and his manners as accustomed to the society of cultivated people and whom society has allowed to rise in class and open a hospital. He is a well-educated black man who went to university in Europe and is now a prominent surgeon who has the respect of his peers among his respected field. Dr. Miller moved back to his hometown of Wellington where he opened up the nursing hospital for the black community. Dr. Miller is a very moderate man who leans more conservative. He is passive about the racism endured from whites. I say he is passive because when Josh tells Dr. Miller that one day he wants to kill Bane because Bane once killed his father, Dr. Miller says, the Bible says that we should forgive our enemies, bless them that curse us, and do good to them that despitefully use us. Miller is essentially written as a house Negro or an Uncle Tom in high class society. We know this because when he's on the train and sees working class black folks, he says they are noisy, loquacious, happy and dirty. Miller's narration then goes on to say that he felt warmth toward them in spite of their obvious shortcomings. On the other side of the spectrum of black men in the 19th century is the character Josh Green. Now, Josh Green isn't talked much about in the book, but his heart and courage make him shine brighter than Dr. Williams to me. Josh is first mentioned at the end of chapter five, when the narration of Dr. Williams describes Josh as a great black figure that jumped off the back of the train stealing a ride. Chestnut writes that Miller recognizes Josh Green as a black giant that worked for Miller's father. In chapter 12, another Southern product, Chestnut created a scene where Dr. Miller and Josh Green meet and have a good conversation. Josh Green comes to Dr. Miller's hospital because he has a fractured arm and tells the doctor that he beat someone up because they called him the N-word. Josh points out that no white man is gonna call him an N-word and keep his health. Dr. Miller then says that if Josh hits the wrong man, then one day he will be lynched. Preaching passiveness, Dr. Miller then says that Josh should endure a little injustice rather than run the risk of a sudden and violent death. The narration of Dr. Miller says that Josh is known for absolute fearlessness. As you can see, Josh Green is written as a more of a field Negro because he's big, strong, and dark, and doesn't respect or believe in Europeans in America. By the end of the story, while Dr. Miller is looking for his family during the massacre, he runs into Josh Green and a group of black men ready to protect themselves and their community. 
Josh Green asked Dr. Miller to be their leader because Josh knows him to be an educated man and that can make good decisions for them all. Yet Dr. Miller gives him every excuse not to lead them. And karma hits him in the end when his innocent child is killed by the mom. Josh ends chapter 32, The Storm Breaks, by saying these powerful words. I'd rather be a dead nigger any day than a live dog. Dr. Miller is obviously the live dog in this situation. If I could rewrite part of the story, I would have Dr. Miller become the leader of Josh Green and his small army. I would have them go to the hospital, create a fort with snipers on top of the hospital and across the streets. Dr. Green, Dr. Miller, being passive and educated, could have just bunkered down until the federal government stepped in to enforce peace. Yet we know that is not what happened in the massacre. So Chestnut didn't give himself the choice to rewrite it. These Europeans had no right to do what they did. And as we know, this massacre led to the Europeans stealing government power that resulted in them winning the upcoming elections and creating segregation and anti-voting laws against blacks. As we saw on January 6, 2021, some Europeans still believe they can illegally steal power and get away with it. The problem I see is no accountability. Lincoln should have thrown every traitor in prison and their future generations might have thought twice before doing it again. Chestnut found a way to teach the history that would be erased through fiction. He showed us the multidimensional aspects of blacks living in the late 1800s while pointing out that some blacks sided with whites while others knew better and kept their guard up. Chestnut shows the edu that education could be the key to equality, but some people in this country do not want people of color to succeed because they're afraid of losing economic and political power. In 2023, I say it's time for an actual federal reconstruction of the United States of America. Thank you.